Hey everyone, um, glad you can join me this evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about organizing rural communities this evening. Um, this is a, a very exciting topic um, that I like to do whenever I get a chance to talk about uh, this very topic. Um, it's, it's for those who may see like on my Facebook as well as you know the Howie Hawkins Facebook as well. Um, you know, it doesn't get talked often about what do we need to be doing when it comes to uh, organizing in rural communities. And so I'm, I'm going to take my time a little bit with this one, um, not gloss over some things, but it's also not going to be like a very prolonged lecture at the same time. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I will look at the chat when I can to see if you have any questions. Um, but if you are a new organizer, welcome. Glad you're here. And if you're a veteran organizer, also welcome. I'm glad you're here also. So whatever side, whatever side of the spectrum you're on, uh, that this is a very, you just need to know this, you know, because whether you take like either like Midwest Academy, Wellstone, even any like labor union training, everything, you, you know, rural communities don't get talked often. The fundamentals is for sure the fundamentals. So it doesn't matter if you're in like Denver, Colorado or Sterling, Colorado or whatever the case may be. Um, organizing, organizing is for sure. But there is some nuances when it comes to organizing. So I'm going to be going through a lot of like topics and then what we need to be thinking about as organizers when we come across these topics in rural areas. And then like towards the end, I'll uh, get to uh, um, like the structuring side of campaigns or what have you. <clears throat> so uh, without further ado, hopefully you can pull the screen up. Thank you. So just to give you an overview of, of who I am. For those who may not know, you know, my name is AJ. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, based here in, in Illinois. I am the currently the uh, co-chair for the Illinois Green Party. I'm also the former co-chair for the Green Party of the United States as well. Um, but I also am affiliated with uh, my, my, my local DSA chapter, the Quasi DSAs. Um, also involved with um, Social Party USA, and I'm also an organizer within the IWW. Um, so I have years of experience as an organizer and activist, and I'm also going to be utilizing a lot of the uh, the, the scholarship side as well. Um, uh, currently a doctoral student in geography, um, specifically human geography, but I also have a background in social service and you know been in the Midwest for... A long, very long time and travel around the country thanks to um, my organizing experience. Um, so I could see a lot of rural areas as well as metro areas and everything. So there is quite a divide when it comes to metro and rural. And so when we, when we look at like a map, and then I'm going to be referencing Illinois a lot. So if we, we can, states like Illinois, you know, there's like Chicago, as you can see up there in the upper northeast side right there by Lake Michigan, the southern part of Lake Michigan. And then surrounding Chicago is the suburbs around there. And then outside those suburbs, you know, there's a whole other part of the states, you know, and in between those are other uh, urban areas, but a lot of in between that is rural, you know, and there's a lot of states make up like our make up like Illinois, whether it's in New York, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, you know, uh, Arizona, you know, it's it's a lot of them are like this. Some states are a little bit more unique than others, and I'll probably talk a lot about those also, but there's always this uh, metro rural divide. And that's very important to understand because we've probably experienced this in organizations that we're involved in, that 
a lot of times meetings are held in more metro areas or urban centers than rural areas. Um, and we need to ask those kind of questions as to how come we don't have like that kind of presence in rural areas. You know, because if, if, if we are really, truly wanting to create change, real social change, real economic change, real environmental change, we cannot negate uh, the reality parts of the states that we're in. And if we do that, uh, we're, we're going to be losing severely, and we have been losing, and I, and I want to emphasize that. We have been losing because we don't pay attention to rural areas. There's even regional div divisions, you know, like uh, the times I spent out in Colorado, you know, you have, as you can see here on the map, you know, you have the high plains out there in the east part of the state. And then you have the front range right there in front of the Rocky Mountains. Then you have the mountains and then you have the Western Slope on the other side. You know, and when you go to states like Colorado, which is always interesting, you know, as a, a, a political nerd, and I've seen this every once in a while on TV, or when you hear these state officials, you know, talk about, you know, those on the Western Slope or those in the High Plains, you know, they, they talk like that for a reason. And you probably heard this elsewhere. Uh, Minnesota, it's those in the Twin Cities and those in the Iron Range, you know, uh, Illinois, it's those from Chicago and those in downstate. Uh, it, you get the picture, you know. So there's even that rural, oh, even that regional division that we have as well. That that we, it's in our rhetoric, and we we hear these things, and these are there for reasons. Those are politicized, and we need to be thinking about how we can like move past. Uh, those kind of rhetoric in order to kind of really form the kind of unity we need to be doing in order to do the change that we need to be having. So let's get some definitions out of the way here. Um, when I say rural, um, th there is no set universal definition when it comes to what does what rural mean. The U.S. Census doesn't have that kind of definition. They're really set by states. So Illinois has a set of definitions as to what does rurality mean. Same way with New York, same way with Arizona. But the one place that we can find some commonality is through the Office of uh, Management and Budget, the OMB, um, out of D.C., so, um, so they do on a, on a basis by uh, county by county, places like Louisiana, it's parishes, New York is boroughs, you know, so you get the picture. Um, other places I've called boroughs also. Um, so, so for the, for the sake of the purposes of this workshop, we're going to use OMB definition. So anything 50,000 plus is Metro, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, Los Angeles. You get the picture. Non-Metro, or sometimes known as urban clusters. Um, this is where they kind of break it down a little bit. Um, micropolitan, that subcategory of non-Metro, uh, micropolitan is between that 10,000 to 49,000, you know, so you, we, we probably know towns like this, you know, they're going to be these, uh, these urban clusters, sometimes they're also known as urban centers. Uh, so like in Iowa, there's like Iowa city, Cedar Rapids, Davenport, um, Michigan, you have your Kalamazoo's, your Grand Rapids, you know. Um, so, again, you, you get the picture of that. This is not the OMB's definition. This is personally my, my personal definition of um, a village. Um, so a, a village 
um, is, is those little areas out there in the rural space that a minimum of 200 people, a minimum of 200 people to even be considered something. And this is where we start seeing the village boards, um, mostly maybe a county board, something of that nature. So it's very bare bones when it comes to some sort of like government infrastructure that's in place there. So we're going to, we're going to be looking at these micropolitan areas and we're going to be looking at like these uh, village areas. So, so from here on out, I will be talking like either like micropolitan villages, so forth and so forth. Um, so if you look at the, uh, map here, you, you know, this is where uh, most of the counties in the United States is, is mostly rural. Um, so these little orange looking, um, squares that you see here, you know, these, these are mostly your rural counties and this is what makes up all like mostly the rural spaces. And even like some of these more shadier places, this is where it's like nothing. And we can start seeing that once we get into the plains, out into the mountain area and into Southwest and West part, you know, this is where it's, there's nothing. And if you've traveled out that way, it's nothing. So, this is the makeup of the United States it is is primarily this. And a lot of the issues that we talk about, um, again, happen to be in the metro side, the suburban areas, um, and maybe bigger areas, bigger urban centers as well. So, so yeah, I mean, this is where a lot of the activities are. This all these things, all these places doesn't get talked about at all. We hear a lot about like, you know, flyover country, which is pretty much the Midwest, the plains that we hear from from time to time. But it's not just the flyover states, you know, look at the parts in the south, look at the parts of the northeast, you know, even the west, you know, there's a lot of places there that we don't talk about and we need to be talking about and organizing it. Um, again, uh, if you can see between this map and the next map, completely rural areas here. So again, there's a lot of it in the United States. Uh, so again, if we look at um, the total population, and again, if we look at states like Illinois, this is where I was talking about. So like in this upper Northeast corner, you know, this area, you know, a lot of issues get talked about a lot in Illinois about in those areas. And even down here, down in like Sagamon state where the capital is, you know, it's just between those two, you know? So everyone thinks that what goes on in Illinois is this, like, no, I mean, that's just in Chicago and the suburbs, you know? No one talks about the stuff we're going to be talking about here in a moment. So you may see a similar situation in your own states as well, um, like this. So here, here's some little statistics. Um, as I say, you know, almost ninety over ninety percent of the United States is, is consists of rural areas. Uh, Nineteen percent of the U.S. population live in these rural areas. Um, and as you can see, seventy percent of the adults uh, live in single-family homes. Sixty-five percent of adults live in the areas in their state of birth. You know, and one in five. And this is this is an important one. One in five are sixty-five and over live in rural communities. So in these rural communities overall is an older population. So as organizers, we need to be thinking about this, you know, so these rural areas are older, you know, so what are some of the issues we, that we'd be thinking about when it comes around rural issues? Like what pertains to them? 
and again, as organizers, we we be thinking about you know meeting people and where they're at. So, for someone who's sixty five or over, like what are the issues that are important to them? Healthcare, Social Security, um, some sort of access to things. So, I mean, these like these are things we need to be thinking about um, as organizers. You know, uh, the same way about single family homes, same way with, you know, um, other issues that may be pertaining to other folks. Just to also give you an idea of um, reality. So to be upfront, not everyone who's indigenous lives on reservation. Okay. Um, with that said, these are th these areas in pink is indigenous land, or what the United States calls this is indigenous land, even though we are all of us because of settler colonialism um, are standing on indigenous land. The government is concentrating indigenous folks into these areas. That's here in pink. So, so again, we, we, we got to be thinking about, you know, these areas. And if we're working with indigenous communities and listening to them as to, like, what is going on in these concentration areas that they are dealing with? What are some of the things they don't have? What's the access they don't have there? Um, so we need to be thinking about all that, you know. So for those of you who live in these states, really thinking about, you know, if if you know folks in, in these indigenous communities, you know, what is what do you what do you know? Like what are the issues that they're dealing with? So here's so here's some of the issues that we're gonna get, get into. So poverty, it, it's, it, it's, it's a real big issue. So let's think about poverty in rural areas. You know, 50% of rural populations between 25 and 64, uh, is in poverty. So think about that for a second. You know, we have working class folks, and this is just like the this is what has been surveyed. Twenty five and over are in poverty in rural areas, and here's the breakdown of those folks who are in poverty. You know, one and a half million children live in poverty. And as you can see here, you know, 9% of white folk are in poverty. But look at the other bigger numbers. 20% black, 17% Latinx, 19% indigenous, 26% LGBT, 30% women with no spouse or partner, 32% women with no spouse or partner, but they have children. So think about these numbers for a moment. The ones that are most vulnerable and the ones who are more historically marginalized, they're the ones being the most affected when they're in rural areas. Now, as you can see, I have a little asterisk there by Asian. Um, th there's not a lot of information um, about rural poverty in the Asian community. I, I really had to dig to find something. And, and here, here's, here's what I have found. And it doesn't, I, I could do a, a whole like three slides on this. So, um, the Pew Research Center, 
um, they had information last year. Did a whole report about um, key facts about Asian Americans. And the one of the things that they pointed out is that, uh, well, I just lost it. <laughs> so, a, a, so Asian Americans don't really have a poverty problem. And what the Pew Research is going at here is they, you really have to go really nationality to nationality on who those folks are. And then their spectrum, uh, they have, you know, those who are Mongolian are a little bit more in the poverty range over those who are Chinese, Koreans, not so much over other uh, Asian communities. So, so um, according to Pure Research Center, um, there is no real information about uh, Asians and Asian Americans in, in rural poverty. That said, as organizers, if we're in our communities and we can see folks and we observe these and we observe people and ask questions, do a little digging, we can find at least information about certain groups in our areas and what those numbers are. Some towns may be bigger than others with these with some of these folks. So, you know, again, these are just overall numbers. And if you do a little, if you do some research, and I'd be more than happy to work with you to find find this information. Uh, you, we would find that some areas may be not are, are huge in themselves in these little local areas. So, we, we, so when we think about these areas, you know, why are these folks have are a little bit more susceptible to poverty, and why is that? Is it because they're getting pushed out into rural areas? Are they? born in these rural areas and they stay there? And if so, you know, what does that look like in those communities? So again, I mean, we, we got to think about these things when it comes to poverty, homelessness. So according to the housing um, urban department, HUD, excuse me, um, this is their uh, definition of homelessness and it's in bold where there's a lack lacks a fixed regular and adequate nighttime residence a primary nighttime residence supervised publicly or private operating shelter an institution that provides temporary residence or a public and private place so if someone fits into one or more of these categories, they are considered homeless, according to HUD. So, I mean, in homelessness, I mean, it's kind of hidden in rural areas because one, some of these homeless folk uh, know where to find shelter. And because it's rural areas, in some towns, pay no mind. Because the one thing rural areas do like to do, depending, and it's not all true for all rural areas, but the ones I know more of, like to sweep things under the rug. Okay, so unlike Chicago, unlike Detroit, unlike Seattle, Portland, um, New York, where I've seen homelessness, I've seen what the police have done to the homeless, I've seen what... <sighs> Local officials have done towards the homeless. Rural rural folks, they, they probably won't do as much. Again, not all of them, but the ones I know of, they would pay no mind. So some of these homeless folks know this, so they'll go sleep at an abandoned building. They'll go sleep 
in a park. They'll go sleep um, by a building, you know, and then no one need to be doing and everything, you know. And the other thing is with homelessness, some folks um, do have friends and family, so they stay with them. So they'll, so they're not deemed homeless. So some of the numbers that we have is just based on this definition. So we need to be thinking about that. So if there is homelessness in your area, in, this, in, in your rural areas, what are the things we need to be thinking about? You know, what does housing look like? What does um, providing social service look like? What does food access look like? You know, what does, again, meeting people and where they're at, meeting their needs, what are we doing in order to address this? So housing, uh, there's a drop in median income, which is down to like 40,000. Again, this is just overall numbers. Um, rural homes are usually substandard. You know, when you go to a rural area, you can kind of tell the state of housing and everything. You know, you may have a town that, has a nicer side of town than the other. And some of us who live in rural areas, we know what that means. They live on that side of town. If you go to the other side of town, th don't go there, you know, and they're, they're pretty substandard. And by substandard, they're usually homes who've been around for a while, haven't been maintained over the, over time. Um, if, if they have, they've been rehabbed and rehabbed, to be looking like something and they don't get the TLC that they need. And so they kind of look run down. The roof might look kind of look caved in a little bit. Siding just looks a little bit off. The paint job may look a little off, you know, their windows maybe look a little, mm, don't know what's going on there. Um, this is, this, so when we go to a real town, we've seen this and we've seen, you know, uh, comedy films and satirical films kind of poke fun at rural areas as such and everything. Um, even shows like trailer park boys, you know, kind of poke fun at substandard housing. You know, that's mainly a trailer park, but even, in, even then that gets fun at, you know, uh, many of and many of these homes are owned by banks or development companies, which leads to a houseless problem. And some of these banks, like in my town, uh, there are at least what's the last number I saw? Thirty homes in my in my town are owned by a bank in Chicago. So why does a Chicago bank? Have any business owning a home in my little town? That is 30 homes not available for folks to utilize. And what happens most of the time when a bank or development company buys up these homes, what they'll do is they'll just sit on and sit on and sit on. And I've seen this with homes and certain businesses that they'll sit there and then that number and that value, property value will just depreciate. <clears throat> and then they'll either knock it down, build something up. This is where gentrification comes into play. And then they'll do a whole new, make it look nice, raise that property value. So, so that's the kind of game that they're playing here. And there's a lot of private public partnerships that go along with this as well. And with housing options, um, they're like uh, an hour or more away. If I had, for those, so my work with um, uh, queer and trans youth, uh, those who are 12 up to 21, um, even uh, young adults. The youth who need housing, we have only two shelters in my town. One's private and one's run by nonprofit. Neither of them will take 
adolescents. And I know one of them will not take uh, anyone who's queer or trans. So, what does that mean? They had to go elsewhere. DeKalb, half hour away. Aurora, closer to 45 minutes away. Peoria, hour south of me. Rockford, hour north of me. The Quad Cities area, uh, another 45 minutes to the west of me. They had to go to far places. So they're isolated here. So think about that for a moment. If you don't have a means of transportation, which we don't have a bus, we don't have trains in my town, you're screwed. So think about living in a rural area and not having those kind of resources like you do in metro areas and suburban areas. You know, so when we think about these, you know, what does housing look or what? Well, yeah, what does housing look like? But what does transportation look like? What does having access to um, basic needs, the house, the shelter, transportation, what does all that mean if we're thinking about organizing in rural areas? So um, I can do a whole separate workshop on this and I would love to at some point with y'all here as well as any events that we all may come to together at, at some point. So this is the part we we lose. The issues I just talked about, uh, we lose on those also because we don't address them. And there's some other issues I'm going to talk about right after this also. But this is where we need to be thinking a lot about as organizers, as political campaigners. And I have these three images up for a reason. So to your left, it's a great book. It's classic text um, by Thomas Frank, as you can see, um, What's the Matter with Kansas? It's a seminal text of what happened in Kansas. Kansas, for the longest time, um, was liberal-ish, you know, um, a kind of New Deal Democrat state. Um but then there was, a, there was a turn in Kansas, and Thomas Frank uh, talks about it in his book. And so what Thomas Frank was talking about, that Kansas went from like this liberal populist state to now this current libertarian state. Right libertarian state. What happened in Kansas was this. A lot of liberals in Kansas pay no mind to any of the voters outside of Topeka, uh, of Kansas City, um, they, they just didn't pay no mind to other rural folks. They just talked to elitists, capitalists that, that was going on in Texas or <laughs> going on in Kansas. Texas is a separate issue. Um, so that was going on, was that. So, and they didn't want to talk about Issues like Social Security. Um, they don't want to talk about issues like abortion because those are, those are what's con considered third rail issues. And it's called third rail because if for those who know about at least like um, electric transit, trains, um, there's like a little third rail there. And it's electrified. And if you touch it, you, 
you essentially you you will die. And it's 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 known by folks that you know Tip O'Neill, who was in Congress, you know, made that term famous. You know, third rail, third rail issues and everything. So Social Security was like a third rail issue in Kansas, and the liberals didn't want to talk about it. But again, what do we what do we just learn? You know, older folks live in uh, rural areas, so liberals didn't want to talk about Social Security, and they were fed up, and so they went turning to people like Bob Dole, uh, other folks like Bob Dole, you know, in Kansas, and then we started seeing. The fiscal conservatives winning races, and then we started seeing a whole bunch of other conservatives winning, the libertarians winning, to now we have Kansas is a very strong Republican libertarian state now. So the other two states here, the one in the middle is Wisconsin. This is their election results. When Scott Walker won governor. Now, uh, for, for those who may know, you know, Wisconsin's kind of, in some people's mind, uh, this liberal oasis in the Midwest. And that's thanks in large part to um, Madison, which is like this dark blue county you see right there in that lower part of the state there if you see on your screen that that's that's dane county then that lonesome blue county to the east um right across dane county that's milwaukee county between those two counties uh, pretty much makes up the the liberal base in wisconsin um and it also brings in 45% of the state's revenue is those two counties alone. But all these counties, this the southern part, a little bit of the central part, even up in Green Bay a little bit, um, was blue states. But then this happened. Wisconsin has won Republicans before, but this was different. This was a different moment. The question became, what's the matter with Wisconsin at this point? Why did Scott Walker win all these red counties? And not just won those, but won the recall election in some of these blue states in the central part went red again. And I, and I wrote an article in, um, in, in Independent Voter Network as to why Scott Walker won. And what I in my analysis was this. That he won because no one paid attention. No one in Wisconsin. Uh, pick your Democrat. Um, Herb Cole, Tom Barron, the mayor of Milwaukee. Um, Feingold. Russ Feingold. All these Democrats, these progressives that everyone loves, um, did not... Pay attention to anyone out in these rural areas whatsoever. They paid. They didn't listen to people up in Rice Lake. They didn't listen to people over in Veracqua. They didn't listen to folks in like um, Muskego. No one. Asquan. None of them. So Scott Walker held that state for a while and then changed the paradigm in the Wisconsin where we now have a Republican stronghold in the state Senate that does everything possible to maintain what they have. So the last one is Illinois. This is the election results when Bruce Rauner won governor of the race. And look at how red that is. Cook County, which is Chicago, and there's some um, that little shelf part up on the northern part of that county there. That's your Evanston's, your um, your Glenviews, your Skokies, up that way, and suburban Cook County. That was the only blue state. 
or the blue county in the entire state. Everyone else was red. And this is where it, it, it was a problem. Um, some of us, like, had to think about this. Like, wow. I mean, we've seen red counties before, but there are places that were blue are now red. Rock Island County, blue. DeKalb County, you know, a little bit blue. Rockford. And so, I mean, for those of us who are not liberal, you know, some of us leftists, you know, we, we, I can't speak for all of us, but in, in the state of Illinois, but at least for myself, I'll make it like, wow, this is um, a uphill battle. And it, it, there's times it is still. Because some of these counties are still turning red and they're staying red. And they're putting money into Republicans to maintain their seats. And even though there's redistricting, and all that. So not to belabor this point, but I hope you can see with Kansas, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, parts of New York, you know, uh, Pennsylvania. We, we have to be paying attention to these things. We have to pay attention like what what happened in Kansas, what happened in Wisconsin, what is going on in Illinois, because it's not just isolated to the Midwest and the Plain states. It's not just there. It's happening in your state right now because no one is listening to rural voters, and that is the problem. Uh, this is the – I just want to show the example like here in Illinois, like – redistricting the uh, image to the, the left is the old um, map, excuse me, and the right one is the new map of congressional maps of um, Illinois. And you can see here, like, when we have redistricting like this, um, you have like, especially in Illinois now, you have like these weird things like this one. If you look at the very top of Illinois, where it's red, and there's Rockford, and it snakes down. That's one congressional district. So think about that. That the Republicans won, even though they're griping about how the Democrats are having control. They still won when it comes to their districts because now they have a latch on rural voters. And looking where the blue is at, you know, the, these other areas, you know, this is where Democrats wanted. Um, this one here on the west side where it says Rockford. Again, Jerry Mandered, Gary Mandered uh, district here. If you really look into that, there's Rockford and there's like Rock Island and Moline right here, right by the Mississippi River, and then comes down here to Peoria. You have three to four major towns so they're so the so the democrats are only tailoring districts where they know they can win in metro and urban centers at they don't care about rural voters at all so look at the ones who are getting rural voters and they're winning this is a state legislative district right now for the house so, again, th this is the new map. Republicans won. They have. They won because they got the rural voters that they need because no one is listening to them. We need to be out there. We need to turn those folks in order to win the issues we need to be doing. So your rural voters are going to be that small business owner, you know. Um, there is a culture of republicanism that they're being conditioned right now. Um, there's a little bit more family values, social values with the rural voter. Um, and Democrats have to look anti-establishment. And by that, I mean, for the longest time in Illinois, the Speaker of the House, Mike Madigan, was Speaker of the House. So every, every Democrat had to look like, well, I'm not – a Mike Madigan person. You know, they had to look that they're anti-establishment, but at the end of the day, they are part of the establishment. 
You know, there's there's still part of the system. So is and again, you think about in your own states, like doing the same thing. These these are the rural voters, you know. Um I'm gonna go through these issues somewhat expeditiously. So like rural health care, you know, all the demographic live in rural communities, they're gonna pay attention to health care, you know. There's limited teleservice now, but because we have, you know, this pandemic rant we're in, kind of help help expedited to have telehealth services now. But I had to take a pandemic to do that, but there's still limited services for telehealth for rural areas. These hospitals in rural areas are just primary care. You know, you're not going to get the advanced care that you need that you would in a in a major area so that you have limited services, no behavioral care, um, prenatal care, no case management. You have to go elsewhere to find that. Um, and these are all located in micropolitan areas, which means you have to drive half hour or more to go to that place when it comes to rural health care. Uh, because we live in rural areas, you know, agriculture, as we know, is a big thing. This map here shows the decline of land that's been lost in rural areas. Um, if you look at the top of the map, oh, this is the top of the graph, excuse me, you know, we're talking about 945 million acres at one point in the 2000s. Go back two years ago. 896 million. And this is the United States. So we dropped significantly in 20 years. Of agricultural land. Now, 17% of that's arable. What do I mean by arable? This is where your corn, your soy um, is going to be growing at. So that's arable land. So... We're losing land, agriculture land, and agriculture is a whole separate issue by itself. We can talk about different agricultural methods in a different kind of workshop. But again, if we're talking about organizing working class farmers, what are the issues we need to be organizing around? What do we need to be thinking about? As environmental, as environmentalists, what do we need to be thinking about when it comes to agriculture? Also. Uh, local infrastructure, infrastructure is not a sexy topic. We know this, but we need to be talking about this, you know. So what does water sanitation supply look like? What does solid waste management look like? You know, um, irrigation, local transport, you know, we need these kinds of things in place. Um and a lot of them are still talking about these things. Some of them don't have some of these things in place. Again, in a town like mine, we don't have local transport. A county service or a county organization, well, a nonprofit, had to put money in for a shuttle. You call them up. Next day, they will shuttle you to where you need to go. That's the transportation. Otherwise, you got to call family, you got to call friends to say, hey, uh, can you swing me by the Walmart? Can you take me to my mom's house? You know, that's transportation. So infrastructure we, we, we don't have or li very limited of. So rural employment. Two graphs here, the one on the left. Um, you can kind of see, um, kind of starting on January to 2019, um, this is unemployment rate, the percentage, this column right here, this axis right here. You know, so the blue line is the non-metro demographic. So if you look at that blue, it was just hovering just under 6%. In 19, January of 19. 
And it was it, it maintained that up until like March, uh, February, March of 2020. And then it spiked. And then there was a decline um, around March. And then a decline kind of went around September and then kind of dipped a little bit and a little bit of increase up until 21. Um, then, yeah, so that spike is now where we have like COVID. These are the COVID numbers here. The, the blue the blue bars are non metro, um, so you can see where the confirmed cases um, per hundred thousand residents here, and you can you can see how like this plays a role like in, in the employment as well. And, and I bring this up because one, we need to, we need to talking about, you know, as organizers and it's difficult for some of us. Oh, how do we organize and activate in a pandemic? And some of us are still having that conversation of what best practices are and, and what have you. And, you know, how we can, we need to be keep fighting this pandemic. At the same time, uh, I mean, yes, rural folks are, are, are hurt for employment. Working class folks are being hurt. The lack of a living wage, the lack of safe work conditions, you know. Um, so when we think about this from a union organizing perspective, from just fighting for economic democracy, perspective what do we need to be doing when we have these kind of numbers and these kind of figures you know and there's the other issues you know public health and substance substance um it's not substance abuse anymore we're, we're you know the, the term we're also calling it is um substance use disorder you know immigration uh, in education and food access and local ecology, you know, these are the other issues that we need to be thinking about as organizers, you know, because th this is happening right in front of us. Um, how do we address folks that may not have an education or lack thereof education? Um, how do we work with immigrant workers? that are working in farm fields or working elsewhere in a restaurant, you know, how do we help them um, to get through living in a rural area? You know, how are we protecting our local ecology? How are we protecting waterways and forests and natural and other natural resources that we have and everything. So again, um, th so as I point out, you know, so where, where Republicans and Democrats lose, as I as I mentioned, um, they don't listen to working class folks at all, because Republicans and Democrats are in the capitalist classes or capitalist parties, right? So they're not going to be listening to working class at all. Both of them are going to be listening to. Big business, big ag. Um, they're going to be focused on metro areas also. Yes, I did say um, Republicans are have a grasp on rural voters. They do. But they're also going to be paying attention to those bigger micropolitan areas. A little bit more than those out there in the corn fields or out there in the soy fields. You know, they're going to be paying attention to the more micropolitan areas. They're going to listen to where the density of the people they are at. They also, so they, they also lose because 
they deem certain things third rail issues. Every issue is not a third rail issue. Every issue is a working class issue. Every issue we need to be fighting on is a political issue because the personal is political, right? My issue is not a third rail issue. Your issue is not a third rail issue. So we need, in my view, to move away from the term and the rhetoric of third rail issues, and we need to be focusing on issues that are at the intersections. So big opportunity is there. For those of us who want to do electoral action, you know, there's chances for third-party candidates, independent candidates like the Green Party to uh, win these areas. And there's a lot of organizing potential here, right? So when we do these things, you know, uh, these, these there's rural organ these rural organizations that we need to be paying attention to. You know, there is a not-for-profit industrial complex that goes on here in these rural areas. Your your United Ways, your Chamber of Commerce, there's community partnerships. You know, all these nonprofits, you know, come together, and they they come together as if they are the ones outside of government who's going to make change. And I set the table at these community partnerships where these nonprofits like United Way, like Chamber of Commerce are at. And they feel that they are the ones who are making real change in these areas. Churches are the same way. A lot of rural, a lot of rural folks, they go to church. And I'm going to tell you, the church they're going to, they're going to be going to, the Methodist Church, Episcopalian Church, Presbyterian Church. Um, you, you might have a Catholic Church. Uh, uh, there's going to be a Baptist Church. You know, but the ones I just named off first, especially Methodist Church, the Methodist Church, they went to every rural area they can since their inception. The Methodist Church felt that it was their mission to go to these rural areas. Lutherans were doing the same thing. Um, go to these rural areas and settle a church. So if you travel along a road in, a, in the rural part of the country and you see a Methodist church, and you ask them, why is there a Methodist church here? They're out there for a reason. They went out there because the Methodist Church goes, you have to go out there. You have to go to the people. Th that's where they went. So a lot of folks in these rural areas have grown up Methodists, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian. And again, you may be your occasional Catholic, um, very much Baptist. So if you're going to be organizing – you know, you may be thinking about uh, working with a hopefully radical friendly pastor, which I am so honored to have worked with in my town and, and in other places. Um, also trying to find an active political organization, if you can, you know, it may be the local peace and justice group, you know, it may be that. Um, it, it might be that small DSA chapter, you know, um, if there isn't any, again, big opportunity. So create that Green Party chapter, create that leftist group in the area and start doing mutual aid stuff and community building and working with folks and what have you. Um, so these, like these organizations, um, you need to be thinking about as to, you know, who are the ones you can work with as well as the ones you need to keep your eye out for. Uh, get a lay of land. Um, you really need to get lay of land, especially if you're, if you're running for office. Um, see what government ent entities exist in your area. Your county boards, your city councils, uh, your village boards. 
you know, research, do your homework, look through the county clerk's office on the voting history of the office you run for and see which offices have been running unopposed for many years and who, who's been in that seat for a while. Why are they running that seat? How much money are they getting? Um, look for unique opportunities for offices. Um, and again, I'm going to use Illinois as an example one again. Uh, so like in Illinois, where I live, outside of Cook County in the suburban part of Illinois, uh, there's a position called county clerk or county coroner. The county coroner at the end of the day um, pronounces the person dead. That's what the, that's that's their main job. Um, someone gets an accident or someone passes, it's the county coroner's job to go where the deceased is at, evaluate it, saying they're dead. But the county coroner in Illinois is the only office that can arrest a sheriff. Okay. So you also don't have to have a medical background. Yes. Thank As you. a fellow Illinoisan, the coroner has, doesn't have to have any medical background. I'm yes. going to go hide back in the control room again. Yes. And that's a very good point. You don't have to have medical background for this. So think about that for a second. If you want to run on a Black Lives Matter platform, County corners like that race, you know, community colleges. If you look at your community college boards, um, they're pretty much the same size or close to the same size as your state Senate district. So my community college board makes up eight counties where I'm at. That's close to the same size of a state Senate district, and it's a six-year term. So you run for community college board, you know, and you sit there for a six-year term. You're taking care of educational issues. You're, take, you're talking, talking about workforce issues. You're talking about agricultural issues. You're talking about you, – you get the picture, right? So take those opportunities to look at issues and take those unique opportunities. And there's other unique opportunities. Like, again, in Illinois, we have like this one shred of democracy available called township meetings. It's the, so like in Illinois uh, right now, on um, April 12th and 13th, there's these township meetings. Prior to that, you have to like send a letter and you can put a question, an advisory referendum, a non-binding advisory referendum on the ballot. Um, do you want to see an improved Medicare for all? Do you want to see an eco-socialist New Deal? Do you um, want to see public broadband in your town? You know, these are the kind of, you know, so you have to get those on the ballot by going to the township meeting which you can choose a moderator doesn't have to be the elected township folk you can choose your moderator at that meeting you get that voted on that goes into the ballot and then those in your township vote on that non-binding referendum yes yes if, you, if you're listening to this and you're like well ag this is performative yes it's very performative these this is performative politics however you can use that to your advantage, okay? If you use tools, like if you take Chris's um, workshop on digital tools, and I do believe Chris talks about Action Network, um, you can use a, a, a platform like Action Network and say you put a question on about defund the police, even if you get 20%, okay, of your township, you can still look at Action Network and then carve out, you know, have an idea where that 20% voted at, and that's who you target to organize to defund the police in your area. 
See where I'm going with this? So, like, these are the things we need to be thinking about along those kind of teams. So a campaign team, you know, can look like it's, it can be a very small staff. You can choose how frequently you want to meet and everything. But you have a campaign manager, your communication director, a volunteer manager, a fundraiser and treasurer at the same position or two separate ones if you can. Vince coordinator. Like, this is a suggested small crew that you need to have for if you're running an electoral um, action campaign. So again, um, and with organizing, if you, again, do your homework and do a lay of the land <clears throat> in your area, you know, you know, attend those community events, go, go to certain community organizations, you know, be present, wear your gear, you know, uh, for the longest time, I, I just wore green party stuff, you know, and at the point I don't wear it anymore. And it's like, oh, it's the green party person. It's AJ, you know, oh, it's a socialist. It's the anarchist. It's it's AJ, you know. So you, you attend these things, you're there and you get known for something. You're associated with something, you know. Oh, you're the union organizer. Oh, you're the fight for 15 person you're the clean water person you know um you go to these events to be associated with something if you have a organizing team this, i apologize it's a campaign team but an organizing team um again you have a campaign manager or doesn't have to be a campaign manager. It can just be a organizing director, field directors, lead organizers, communication director, treasurer, fundraiser, an event manager too. Um, it can be a small team or a big team. Um, but if you're creating a local movement, then that is going to get bigger. You may have coalitions. So you may have to have coalition meetings, right? So what does that look like? Um, and then you do various acti activities, whether it's electoral action or organizing, throw your house parties. If you can, throw a virtual one. Um, speaking events, go to a speaking event or get invite, ask someone that you, you've worked with and saying, hey, can I uh, speak at this event? Um, maybe get endorsements, depending on what you're gonna be doing for. Um, build that database. You gotta build that database. Um, have a story focused campaign. Use narratives. Use those narratives and take it to the public and do public narratives out there. Build that base. Do one on one organizing. Talk to someone. Get to know that person. Build that relationship with them. And then do it with the next person and the next person. Maybe you built that organizing committee right there with five or six people. And then now you can build some sort of organization around that, whether it's informal or formal. Canvas with those groups, with your group and everything. That is the end of... That presentation, hopefully this works. Cool. Um, I captured you all here a little over an hour. I'm glad you're still with me. Hopefully that was informative. Um, I will take um, a few questions, if there are any questions at this time. Um, Andrew says, uh, let me ask you a question. What's my opinion on the concept of modernizing Steam locomotives with eco-friendly parts, um, replacing with Um, yeah, I mean, there's that big movement, um, uh, like for high-speed rails. I don't think you're specifically talking about how high-speed rails, but yeah, I think trains in themselves. I mean, we if we're thinking about the big what-if questions, um, I think we need to be thinking about how do we make trains a little bit more eco-friendly, um. And when we do that, what does that mean to make those trains more efficient? 
and effective um, for transportation or for whatever means necessary. But yeah, I think um, uh, modernizing steam locomotives uh, is, is the way to go. And I think um, there are other folks than myself who can probably speak more to that question that you have and everything. But I, yeah, I think we, I, I think we can. Yeah, I couldn't help but jump in again. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a county of 5,000, so um, this is an issue near and dear to me. But, you know, even outside the question of steam trains, these small towns all used to have train stations. Yeah. Before the before culture be, car culture became the mainstream, um, you know all of these. Type, my, one of my friends' fathers actually owns his town's old train station. They were going to tear it down, and he said, "If I move it to my property, can I have it?" And they said, "Yes." And it's a wood shop on his property, um, you know. But and this is a town of maybe eight hundred max. Um, and they had a train station and a lot of these, the trains still run through these towns. Um, the tracks are there. Um, and so a big part of, you know, kind of greening the transportation, greening transportation, you know, steam or electric or however it does is regional light rail. And when you get regional light rail into these, you know, kind of epicenters that you can then connect to bus to more rural communities, right? So like where I grew up, you could have regional light rail that connects into, you know, where I live now that has a population of 110,000 and an Amtrak station, right? It can connect to my hometown of 2,300 and there can be buses that go multiple times a day to the 200 and the 800, you know, population towns. And that's how we, you know, can really start having this kind of stuff. And then that provides access to services that provides easy public transit access to services. So I think this is a really important issue um, in terms of something we can focus on. Um, the farmers would love this, you know, it means people, you know, they can, maybe they can get trains to stop again, um, you know, and it, but and it can help for movement, you know, address, help us to, you know, ad adapt. Um, and it can also help bring industry back and manufacturing back to these rural communities, which it's been devastated. Um, so yeah, it, we had a candidate run in 2018 in Southern Illinois, Randy Yorkshire for Congress, and he made regional light rail his like key central thing. He had a company from Canada that did hydrogen. Um, there was an old train factory in district that he wanted to repurpose with that company and making hydrogen trains and they wanted to basically reactivate the old regional light rail that ran through. Um, so yeah, it's a huge issue for, for rural communities. Other Andrew says, how do you suggest progressive ideas to lifelong conservatives in these areas in a way that you don't scare them off? I think I'm going to separate this and I'm going to respond to this in, well, two responses. The first one is I think we really need to be thinking about like, what do we mean by conservative at this point? Um, because the conservatives that we have now, um, unless I'm proven otherwise, are not going to listen. Um, we're dealing with conservatives who are really making a cultural shift in the Republican Party right now. And in some ways, the Libertarian Party, too, to be quite honest, in my view. Um, you have these folks who don't think of the party, they think of themselves. And so you're not going to change them, their minds at all now. So that's my first response. The second response is the other kind of conservatives, which are the ones that our parents and probably grandparents are more used to, um, your Reaganites, your um, William Buckleyites, um, those kind of conservatives, conservatives back in the 50s. You know, some of them are still staunch in their ways, and I, and I know some of them also, 
and they're very staunch. But to your question, Andrew, um, it really you do need to have that conversation with them, and it's going to be not just one, not not two. It's going to be many conversations, and you just really need to get through those issues with them and actually talk to them about that stuff. We're not going to sell them on socialist ideas. We're just we're just not. But that said, I think we can sell them on certain ideas. I mean, if you go to like um, Howie Hawkins not US and some of the platform planks on there, there's some of those ideas that we can really sell them on on there. Um, one of them, and I think it's still on the website. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. We talk about a guaranteed income tax. You know, I mean that we can sell them something on that because that is something that Thomas Friedman did talk about. And a lot of folks like we're okay, we're okay with that. So something like graduate, like a, a guaranteed income tax, like we can sell them on that. You know, we may not sell them on community control healthcare, but I think we can get them there if we show them like how it's done right. Um, and actually show them an example of what's going on and everything. So hopefully that answers your question, Andrew, because um, yeah, we have to understand what conserves we're, we're talking about because the ones we're talking about now, you might as well you might as well talk to this wall right here, quite honestly. So, so something cool is something cool is happening, and um, Andrew, I'm in Springfield. Um, I literally have a partially written written email to you, um, but um, yeah, and so yeah, Andrew. Signed up through our Green Socialist website, happened to be located 20 minutes away from me. Um, nice. So good news is you're not alone, right? And that's something I think that that you know progressives and socialists in rural areas need to understand. You're not alone. There is a silent you know minority out there that that you know thinks like you do. My my county of 5,000 would get you know a couple hundred votes for Greens, 100, 200 votes for Greens every election. That's a group of people, right? That are going out of their way to 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 make you know make a different choice. So when we're talking about like real deep red rural places, um, you know, not so much suburbs, right? But like actually deep red rural. I, I mean, my big question is: Are they actually conservatives? Are they the only thing that's available to them? Right? The Democrats have abandoned them. Um, they're being social issue baited by um you know republicans they're getting riled up about things that they know that you know that, that don't affect their everyday lives um they're becoming you know these you know family values voters and but the reality is the rural areas of this country have been devastated right manufacturing is gone the, we just talked about trains you know the, the transportation infrastructure is gone um Farmer, small farmers are losing their farms to giant corporations and mega farms. Um, Monocrop, you know, agriculture, chemical agriculture has not been good on the rural community unless they're, the, they're a medium to large farmer. Um, so, you know, much like urban working class communities, the huge working class base of rural communities has been abandoned by both parties. Um, they're not happy with the Republican policies in many cases, and they're right and they're not paying attention to the actual, you know, economic policies that impact their lives because they're being riled up on, you know, and really baited with religion and things like that. Um, but I don't think that's over, not overcomable. Um, you know, AJ talked about Methodists and how they went, you know, the big thing that the Methodists did was the Methodists went where there wasn't as much competition. And here's the thing that we need to think about as Greens and, and about in, as independent socialists. You know, we have a hard time in a lot of cities because it's hard to find our space because there's always a large, massive, powerful Democratic establishment that can keep us out. There's left Democratic front groups like DSA, PDA that start pulling in, you know, people adjacent to us into the Democratic Party or at least into its, you know, orbit. Um, and now we're fine, you know, oftentimes Greens find themselves to the left or to the right 
of parts of places, things like DSA in these cities, right? So Greens have a really hard time establishing a foothold. And there's a, I could do a whole workshop and articles on, you know, how we've spent 35 years and never defined ourselves. And that's yeah. a big part of the problem, but we're having a hard time there like the Methodists who couldn't, you know, if you're in the city and you're fighting all of these other established, you know, major religions, it's going to be hard to get your foothold. So they went where there wasn't competition. They went to the rural communities. Um, and as someone who grew up in a Methodist, I'm, you know, I'm not religious anymore, but someone who grew up in a Methodist church in a rural community, you know, I can say it was a pretty liberal place. In comparison to the politics of the people that went there, the things that they espoused in church were very liberal compared to the things they espoused, you know, in a political situation. And it's a lot of it is, you know, getting riled up by, you know, Republican conservatism. Um, but it hasn't helped them. So, you know, in the idea, you know, AJ said we can't sell them on um, on Medicare for all. We have something like 52 or 54 percent of all poll voters support it. So we've already won them. Mm -hmm. right um they want it they're uninsured and the, the nearest health clinic <clears throat> you know a half an hour to hours away I, I live six blocks from two hospitals in a, re a regional medical center that serves all of central illinois probably two dozen counties um you have to drive two hours if you need anything other than you know basic medical care a checkup um a pharmacy and so they would you know these rural communities in, if they, if they, if you can get through, if you can build the relationships that allow you to have long-term conversations and actually get through to people, because yelling at someone on the internet doesn't get through, right? You have to know someone, you have to talk to them, you have to build a relationship. What the, what you'll find out is they would love a national health service right. where publicly, democratically, locally controlled, you know, health clinics would open up in these small towns where they would get direct act. They wouldn't have to go half an hour to get to my town of twenty three hundred. Mm -hmm. right to get basic medical care so they could get it in their hometown and they wouldn't have to travel two hours unless something was really serious right we could actually start giving access to people on things like that um so i you know you told you when you when you're organizing a rural community you tone switch right you you talk about issues differently but the same issues affect us all economic inequality corporatism take you know actually absolutely taking over everything is a big issue in rural communities it's why they don't have jobs anymore outsourcing is why they don't have jobs anymore consolidation and big farms buying them up is why they don't have jobs anymore um these progressive issues are very very popular um and they are you know farmers are worried about climate the people they elect that get rile them up and get them voting on abortion may not be but farmers are worried about climate Right, they they know they understand what happens if their soil changes even a little bit. Um, so, you, we've just got to you know it's all about like just in any kind of organizing, it's all about building those relationships, building those roots. Like AJ said, show up, be reliable, do some things. People will start listening. Not seeing any other questions. We've been here an hour and a half. I think we yeah. can. Yeah. Cool. So I hope, so I hope everyone got something out of this. Um, I'm glad you stayed with us for this long. Um, and um, if you have any questions, message us on GSOP, Green Socialist Organizing Project. Um, and we'll get we'll get back to you and hopefully you know once this when we're done with this share this with friends embed it on your website your your social media share this far and wide um because again um we, we don't talk about rural issues enough and rural organizing enough so uh, so i'm glad you're here and if you have any other questions get a hold of us so thank you all for being here Appreciate you. Yeah, and thank you for doing this, AJ. We'll we'll be doing more and more of these education um, and trainings, and you know, getting into kind of niches and dive, deep diving into some areas like this in the future. Um, make sure you check out Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, Howie is going to be doing a special uh, episode of his podcast um, on workers' rights and COVID. Um, so that should be good and um, 
sign up at greensocialist.net so you can get emails about all this stuff. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.